Okay, so keep your Bibles open there in Acts chapter 10. Um, now, we started last Wednesday a series, well, it's, it's part of the Rightly Dividing series, uh, going through the books of the Bible. We went through uh, a lot of the books of the Old Testament. Uh, we didn't actually reach halfway. We went through the first five books, which is known as the, the books of Moses or the Pentateuch. We also went through the historical books, and we, you know, I was trying to give you some bite-sized summaries of each book to help you understand the history of Israel and how all these books come together. And uh, now we're going to finish off the Old Testament tonight. And again, it's not so much, I'm, pre- I'm not so much preaching to you guys, I'm more teaching you about the Bible. So I hope you pay attention and take these things in. Because I wish I had this knowledge when I started reading my Bibles. I wish I had this knowledge as I started to try to piece these things together. When you, get, when you can see the bigger picture, it all starts to make a lot more sense. But there in Acts chapter 10, look at verse number, number 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. I want you to notice there that the preaching of Christ, you know, uh, was there beginning there with John the Baptist as he was doing his baptisms. Let's keep going. Um, Verse number 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Now let's drop down to verse number 43. To him, speaking of Jesus, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. That's so important because the previous verses we were reading was John the Baptist being sort of that primary preacher that introduced Christ, that started preaching of Christ. And yet Peter then takes a break and says, well, hold on. It's not just John the Baptist, all the prophets, all the prophets gave witness of Jesus Christ and that's such an important truth and uh, you need to really understand this you need to get this truth into your heart because again uh, many Christians they love the New Testament it's easy to understand it's easy to read through and you know we love Jesus Christ he's the he's the centerpiece of the entire Bible Jesus Christ is the Word of God we have the Word of God in our hands to help us learn of Jesus Christ it is of the same nature they both of, of God you know, we have an eternal book. Jesus Christ is our eternal God. And so if you're skipping all the prophets, as was mentioned here, you're also skipping knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, the New Testament gives us a lot to learn, but the Old Testament tells us a lot more of Jesus Christ. And, you know, some of these prophets weren't even fully aware of everything they wrote, but we know it points us to Christ, so we can't avoid the Old Testament. So today we're going to be going through the rest of the Old Testament books, We're going to be looking at the poetry books, the books of poetry. Uh, The books of poetry are also known as the books of wisdom. Some people like to use those terms interchangeably sometimes. And also looking at the prophets, the prophets of old. So please take your Bibles and actually uh, go to the book of Job. If you can start with the book of Job, that's the first book of the books of poetry or the books of wisdom. And the books of poetry, the books of wisdom are five books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Those those five books make up what is known as the poetry books or the books of wisdom. Okay. Now when it comes to Job, he's a very interesting person. If you go to Job chapter 42. uh, Sorry, Job chapter 6. Job chapter 6 verse 4. Job chapter 6 verse 4. Now, last week we went through the history. We're going through the history of Israel What we want to do now as we look at these poetry books, as we look at these prophets, is try to piece together where in history do these guys live? Where in history did they write these things? And when it comes to Job, we have a few clues here. Job chapter 6 verse 4. It says, For the arrows, these are the words of Job, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, the poison whereof drinketh up my spirit, the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. What I want you to notice there in verse number 4 is that Job refers to God as the Almighty. In fact, when you look at the term Almighty in reference to God, it is used the most, the, the most times in the Bible in the book of Job. And this gives us a really great idea as to when this book was written. You see, the Almighty there is in, in Hebrew, El Shaddai. You know, some of you guys are familiar with that term. And in, in uh, Exodus 6 verse 3, you don't need to turn there, 
God says to, to Moses, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. Hey, it's the same name that Job was using. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So what did uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob call God? The Almighty, right? The Almighty. Uh, God Almighty. What does Job call God? The Almighty. So straight away we have an idea of when Job lived. He would have been a contemporary around the time of Abraham. Okay? That's not the only clue that we get about Job. Uh, the other clue we, where I asked you to turn last time was Job 42. Go to Job 42 verse 16. Job 42 verse 16. Another reason why we could say he's a contemporary of, of Abraham, lived around that same time. Job chapter 42 verse 16. The Bible says, after this, now what, after what? Now you guys know the book of Job? He went through a lot of suffering, lost his children, lost his possessions, you know, went through a lot of hardships. But after the hardships, after this, lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So after he goes through these hardships and, you know, he's restored back, he has another, more family, has more children, and he sees, uh, you know, his grandchildren, not just his children, but his grandchildren. But it says here that he lived 140 years. This is after his suffering. We don't really know how old Job was. He could have easily been around 200 years old, you know, easily. So with that in mind, that kind of fits the idea of, you know, living around Abraham's time. Remember, you know, as we go through history, we start to see, uh, you know, uh, when God created man, they lived for many hundreds of years. And after the flood, that time period started to, or, or the length of life started to drop down. And Abraham, do you guys remember how long he lived? It was 175. So based on that time frame of how long Abraham lived, seems like Job lived around that same length of time. So this gives us the idea of when Job lived. Now, Job was obviously not an Israelite. There was no such thing in those days. He was not a descendant of Abraham. He was a man that lived in the land of Uz. And so it's, it's great. I love, I love seeing stories of other people that are not just, you know, from the lineage of the Israelites or the Jews. You know, we see that God also has his heart placed on faithful men that are even made up of, you know, uh, Gentile places as well. So that's Job. You know, we know the story of Job very well. You know, it's, it's a book that really uh, shows us a few things. The emphasis is on the greatness of God, knowing the greatness of God, even in the midst of suffering. And uh, it also shows us how Satan is the accuser of the brethren. We hear about that in the New Testament, the accuser. We see, you know, in, in the book of Job, how he goes up to God and, you know, he, he goes there in the midst of the sons of God. And, you know, it's just, a, just, just there as, a, as, a, as a, like a thought, sore thumb, you know, um, the, the, the accuser of the brethren. But it also shows God's confidence in faithful men. That's what I like the most because God's able to point, you know, Job to Satan and say, man, you know, that is a faithful man. He's just, he's perfect. And it, it's, it's great to know that God also, you know, has trust in men that are walking in his ways, that are faithful in his ways. So after Job, we have the book of Psalms. And, uh, you know, the Psalms is the, the song book of the Bible, the song book of the Bible. And uh, it is made up of, a hundred, uh, of a 150 songs. But it's not only used for songs, it's also used for prayers. A lot of it are prayerfully sung. I mean, a lot of our hymns as we sing them, you know, they're great songs, but you can also use them as prayers, uh, lifting your hearts up to God. So it's a collection of uh, 150 songs. Now, this is a collection of songs. The, the collection of songs is, is a time period of about a thousand years. For about a thousand years, just different songs have been added to this list of psalms. And uh, the, the main writer of the book of Psalms, the one that wrote the most Psalms, is David. I mean, many times your Bible will just tell you straight out when you look at the Psalm, this is a Psalm of David. And that was actually written there in the, in the manuscripts as well, a Psalm of David. David is um, recognized for writing 73 Psalms, but he probably wrote even more than that. But they just weren't, you know, attributed to his name. Um, another one uh, that uh, w uh, wrote quite a few Psalms was Asaph. Now, maybe, maybe this is interesting, so please go to 1 Chronicles chapter 25. 1 Chronicles 25. I just want you to look at this. 1 Chronicles 25. Because we have Old Testament song leaders, all right? When it came to the temple worship, there were song leaders, just like we do have, you know, in church. And, I, and I'm seeking for the song leader for our church, 
you know, help me out. You know, a few men have, have put their hand up and it's been great, but I'm looking for that one man that just wants to take ownership of it. And in 1 Chronicles 25 verse 1, look at this. Moreover, 1 Chronicles 25 verse 1, Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph. Now, that name should sound familiar. If you've been reading your Psalms, quite often you'll notice the Psalms of Asaph. Okay? And uh, those Psalms, there are um, 12 Psalms that are written like that by Asaph. Now, it's not always Asaph, but it's also the, the song leaders for the house of God wasn't just Asaph, but his descendants, his children, and his children's children would serve in the temple as song leaders and musicians and things like that. Service, let's keep going, verse number one, sons of Asaph and Heman and Judah, uh, uh, Jeduthan, who should prophesy with harps, with um, psalteries and with cymbals, and the number of the workmen according to the service was. And then later it goes to the, to the families and all that. So I just, just want to show you there that these men were appointed to write songs and play music and they also contributed, some of them, to the Psalms. Now, another interesting one that might blow your mind um, is that 11 of the Psalms were written, it says, by Korah. Okay? Now, who's Korah in the Bible? Very famous man, actually. You know, a man that rebelled against the, the authority that Moses was given, uh, that God gave to Moses, you know, and um, the earth opens up and swallows him. He, goes, he, he, he descends physically into hellfire. And so it's really interesting that, um, I'll just quickly read to you from Numbers 26 verse 10. I'll just read it to you. Numbers 26 verse 10, it says, And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah. So everyone else that was together with Korah rebelling against Moses. When that company died, what time the fire devoured 250 men, and they became a sign. But then verse 11 says, Notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. Well, here's the great thing about this story. The children of Korah were also singers. Children of Korah were also musicians, and they wrote 11 psalms that were added to the Bible. So when we see this story of this wicked man, you know, we think about how, you know, how, you know, how God destroys this man. It's great to know that, hey, you could actually be a descendant of someone extremely wicked, someone extremely reprobate, and God can still use you. God can still use you even if your historic, you know, your, 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 your ancestors were wicked people. And that's what I love about the, the Psalms there, that uses the, the, the sons of Korah that wrote many of these Psalms. I'm sure they learned the lesson, knowing about dad Korah, or grandfather Korah, you know, that went through that, uh, uh, that judgment of God. And uh, another interesting fact you might not be aware of, Moses. Moses wrote one of the Psalms, and that's Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses. And, uh, and then there was other, other people that wrote some psalms as well. And the, the psalms can also be divided into five books, but I'm not going to go into that today. Maybe one day, I think one day I'll preach a sermon on this, but the book of psalms can actually be divided into five books themselves. After the psalms, we have the Proverbs. The Proverbs. Who wrote Proverbs? The Bible says in Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So very quickly, easy to tell the book of Proverbs, known as the book of wisdom, Right, there's a lot of great wisdom, a lot of great advice uh, in, this, in this book, and it's written by Solomon. But not only Solomon, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 1, says, The words of Agar, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ethiel, even unto Ethiel and Ukal. So Proverbs chapter 30 has the words of Agar, the son of Jacob. Okay? So, you know, not only did Solomon write these Proverbs, but it appears that he also collected great wisdom, great problems from other men and put them together into his collection. And of course, a great example of that is Proverbs 31, verse 1, which says the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. And I do believe King Lemuel is Solomon. So he takes the wisdom of his mother, you know, and he also includes them in the Proverbs. So that's a Proverbs, a great book of wisdom. Uh, and then after Proverbs, we have Ecclesiastes. Now, Ecclesiastes, um, for Spanish speakers anyway, for Spanish speakers, kind of rings a bell. It probably, for English speakers, you probably won't fully understand just by the title what this is about. But the word Ecclesiastes is a Latin transliteration of the Greek word Ecclesia. Ecclesia. Do you guys know what Ecclesia is? Church, yeah. In Spanish, church is Iglesia. So you can see where it comes from, Ecclesia. In Spanish, Iglesia is the church. 
And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's a name, Ecclesiastes, given to a congregation or to a church. In fact, I mean, if you guys, you guys can go there if you want, you know, Ecclesiastes, as we go through this, Ecclesiastes 1.1, Ecclesiastes 1.1, it says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So it's pretty obvious who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, who was the son of David, Solomon, the king, to Jerusalem, the words of the preacher. Not only was he a king, he considered himself a, a preacher. And so even though we don't have the New Testament churches in effect at this point in time, we can see that this is a book in the Old Testament for pastors, for preachers, you know. And I know a lot of churches, you know, avoid the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, I, I've heard it said, hey, it's better not to preach from the book of Ecclesiastes because it's very confusion, confusing. Man, it's, a, it's about the church. It's about a preacher. You know, so we should take these words and, and teach it to the congregation. In fact, if you go to verse chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, which is the climax of the entire book, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So what's the job of the preacher? Hey, it's to, to preach the fear of God. It's to preach the commandments of God to keep them. It's to preach what, what our duty is of man, of man toward God. That's really what, you know, if you want to summarize what the preacher does, that's what he does. He gets behind the pulpit preaching this to the church, to the congregation. So it's not a book that churches ought to avoid. After the book of Ecclesiastes, we have the Song of Solomon. Go to Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. The Song of Solomon, or also known as the Song of Songs. Ecclesi uh, sorry, Song of Solomon 1.1. 1, 1. Look how it starts off. It says, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. The Song of Songs which is Solomon's. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, it says, speaking of Solomon, it says, And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Wow. We don't have 3,000 proverbs in the book of Proverbs. Okay? We see that you know, Solomon spent a lot of time learning, gaining knowledge, writing his own wisdom down, and he also wrote 1,005 songs. So this gives us an idea of what the Song of Solomon is. When it says the Song of Songs, you can basically interpret it in two ways. This could be a book or a song of a collection of songs. So maybe he takes his best songs, his best lyrics that he has, and he formulates one song book with his favorite things within those uh, lyrics. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, but I take the position by the Song of Songs that he's saying this is the best song that I've ever written. Of the 1,005 that I wrote, of all the 1,005 songs that I wrote, I believe this is the song of the songs. This is the best one that I have, and that's probably why it's recorded for us in canon here for us. And of course, it, it's a great book um, about the intimacy uh, between husband and wife. I believe if you read this book together, it's going to strengthen your marriage. It's going to bring the romance back into your, your family life. And... Um, yeah, that's what it's about, guys. It's about marriage. It's about uh, romance between husband and wife. So if you're lacking a bit in that area, better read Song of Solomon. Okay, it's a Song of Songs, a great book. So those are known as the, the books of poetry or the books of wisdom. Now we're going to get into the prophets, the prophets. There are 17 books in the Bible that are known as the prophets. And these books are usually broken down in two categories, the major prophets and the minor prophets, okay? So, when the Bible, you know, or when we use these terms, the major prophets, we're not saying these prophets are more important than the minor prophets, okay? The general idea behind calling it the major prophets is that they have the longest books. As, you know, it, it takes a while to read through their books. They've got a lot more writing. When it comes to the minor prophets, it's just that their books are shorter. But they're all important prophets. You know, they're, they're all just as important as one another, and that's, but that's the reason why they're called major and minor prophets. So the major prophets, the first one is Isaiah. Please go to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. And these prophets are basically prophesying during the times of the kings, okay? And in particular, once the nation of Israel had been divided into two nations, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And in Isaiah 1, 1, the Bible says, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, 
in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So here, if you, if you get the history and you know when these kings lived, you see that Isaiah was a prophet that lived, uh, or that, that was used by God, prophesied during the reigns of four consecutive kings. You can see that. If you work out when they lived, then you'll know exactly when Isaiah was preaching, and then it will make a lot more sense to you. It will be more applicable because you'll know the nature of Israel during that time, or Judah, because he was a prophet to the southern nation of Judah. That was his job, to the southern nation of Judah. Isaiah 53 um, is a is very famous chapter which describes, you don't need to turn there, but just describes the sufferings of Christ leading up to the cross, his beatings, his whippings, and his crucifixion and his death. Um, and even his burial is all covered there in Isaiah 53, a very detailed description of Christ's suffering. And uh, the book of Isaiah is very famous for a couple of reasons in the New Testament. Number one, it's the book which Jesus Christ read. If you remember when he went to the synagogue, he, he opened up the, the book of Isaiah. Or was it the temple? He went to the temple. I've got to fact check that. I think he went to the temple now that I think about it. Yeah, and he opened up the book of Isaiah and he, he, he read out a portion there. It's also famous for the Ethiopian eunuch. If you remember, the Ethiopian eunuch was on the chariot on his way back and he was reading a, pa- a portion of the book of Isaiah. And he, he asked uh, the evangelist, you know, of whom am I reading about? Like, who's this guy? And I personally believe he was probably reading um, Isaiah 53 about the sufferings of Christ. And so that's, that's the book of Isaiah. Then we get to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is another prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. And uh, Jeremiah would prophesy of the coming judgment and captivity of of Judah into the hands of the Babylonians. So basically, he was preaching a lot of judgment. In fact, a lot of these prophets are preaching judgment. I mean, that's kind of the key thing, right? It's it's, it's very similar to the judges, right? Before the times of the kings, you have the nation of Israel you know, get into wickedness, turn their hearts against God. God would raise up judges and basically get them back on track. It's kind of the same idea. You know, these nations would, would turn their hearts against God, would be doing wickedly. The God will call these prophets to preach judgment against them and try to get them right. And so, um, yeah, he basically preached the coming judgment and captivity of the Babylonians. And, um, Oh yeah, Jeremiah is also recognized for its prophecies of the future new covenant to come. He talks about a lot of the new covenant. You know, talking about this old covenant is going to be replaced and a new covenant is going to come uh, to be given to the, the, uh, to the Israelites. Then we have the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. Now when it comes to Lamentations, it comes from the word lament. What does the word lament mean? Anyone? Sorry? To whine? Kind of. It's like grief and sorrow. To lament. If you're lamenting about something, you're weeping, you're grieving about something, you've got grief. Okay? And uh, the reason behind this, and and the writer of Lamentations is Jeremiah once again. Uh, The reason for this is because he wrote this during the captivity. Right? In Jeremiah, he, 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 he prophesies of the captivity of Babylon. But in Lamentations, it's happening. It's happening. You know, Jerusalem is being uh, conquered. You know, it's being destroyed. And people have been taken into captivity. And so he, as a preacher, is weeping about what he's seen. You know, that the, the, Israel, uh, the, the, um, Jude, uh, the Jews are being taken into captivity. And if you look at Lamentations 1.1, Lamentations 1.1, it starts off like this. How doth the city sit solitary? That's the city of Jerusalem. That was full of people. How is she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princes amongst the province, provinces, how is she become tributary? So you can see just immediately, just starts off like that. He's just upset about the state of Jerusalem because he's writing this at the time when they're being taken into captivity, conquered by the Babylonians. Then we have the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is written during Judah's captivity by the Babylonians. Okay, So Judah is now... In captivity by the Babylonians, they've gone into exile. And if you go to Ezekiel 1.1, Ezekiel 1.1, go to Ezekiel 1.1, it just gives that context for us. It says, Now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives, there it is, the captives, by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God 
in the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. So you have the terms there, the captives and the captivities. It's during the time of King Jehoiakim's time where, where Babylon came in and conquered uh, Judah. So you can see it's written during the time of captivity. And most of the book of Ezekiel is about God's continual judgment on Judah during these 70 years of captivity. But it also ends with a hope of restoration, a hope of their return back to the land. And it also contains references to the millennium. Because a lot of the, the, the references of them coming back to the land and rebuilding Jerusalem and all that stuff, that is then uh, typified or used as a type about the millennial reign of Christ as well in the future. After Ezekiel, we have the book of Daniel. And Daniel is a very famous one, of course. Um, Daniel is, um, well, basically, he also, during the uh, time of captivity of Babylon, he was one of the, the wiser, you know, ne Nebuchadnezzar basically requested that the best and wisest men of Judah be taken into service for him. You know, service for him. He wanted the wise man. You know, he was a very smart person. You know, he wanted to take, you know, the best that other nations had to prop up his kingdom. You know, to prop up his kingdom. And, and Daniel was one of these uh, men. And what's interesting about the book of Daniel, it gives us a lot of insights. One of those few books that gives us a lot of insights into a foreign nation. You know, just, just the, 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 uh, like a pa total pagan nation and how they went about doing things. Because most of the other books, we, we know about the internal matters within Israel. But this one really gives us a great picture of, of Babylon uh, because he lived there. Basically, Daniel lived there the entire 70 years of captivity uh, during that time. And the book of Daniel can be divided into two sections. It's essentially, it kind of feels like two books in some ways. Um, chapters 1 to 6 is about uh, the Babylonian captivity. So we have some of the great stories like the, the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace. We have the stories of you know, Daniel being thrown into the, into the lion's den, those kind of exciting things. But then chapters 7 to 12 is, almost feels kind of different where it's, a, it's prophetic writings about the end times. Prophetic writings about the end times talks about the Antichrist and coming tribulation and all those things. It's a, very similar to the book of Revelation. And it has a lot of common themes, a lot of common themes with the book of Revelation. All right, so those are the major prophets. And again, they're called major because their books are the longer, longer ones, okay? And now we come to the minor prophets. So the first minor prophet is Hosea. If you guys are following, you can keep turning uh, to Hosea. And uh, Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom, okay, to the northern kingdom of Israel. I wrote Judah here, but Israel, my notes are wrong. And... Um, he preaches against Jeroboam the second, okay, Jeroboam the second. And it's, it's an interesting story because Hosea had an unfaithful harlot wife. In fact, God told him to marry this woman. And he had this unfaithful harlot of a wife to which God then uses in, in his own personal life, in Hosea's own personal life, to use his wife as, as an illustration, okay. And, you know, it's basically how Israel was to God an unfaithful harlot of a wife. You know how Israel had turned to other gods, to, to idol worship. And it's just a reminder to, to know, you know, when we, when we, if we turn our hearts against the Lord, when we have idols in place instead of putting God first in our lives, how God feels about that. It's like spiritual adultery in his eyes. So it's a very, it's a very powerful book in that sense where you get to see how God feels about sin. I mean, if you had men, if you had an unfaithful wife, not just an unfaithful wife, wife, but an harlot of a wife, basically a prostitute. I mean, it'd destroy your life almost, right? So you, you can understand just, just how spiritual idolatry, you know, how, how, how uh, hurtful, how damaging that is in the, in the eyes of God, how sinful and wicked it is in the eyes of God. So that's, that's um, Hosea. Then we have Joel, and Joel was a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, and um, it suggested that, some of these things, some of the, you know, you can't always pinpoint exactly, but it's suggested that he preached sometime between 800 to 900 BC. And the reason that they say that is because he mentioned certain nations that were active at the time, and those nations, you know, active at the time, historically, you can kind of look back to that time period, about 800 to 900 BC. And Joel also offers a detailed look at the day of the Lord. He speaks a lot about the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath to come, um, again, prophesying of future events. Then after Joel, we have the book of Amos. Amos. So Amos was from the southern kingdom, but his prophecies were against the northern kingdom, against the northern nation of Israel. Again, again, against, namely, Jeroboam II. He was a pretty wicked man. 
And if you go to Amos 1.1, go to Amos 1.1. Amos 1.1. It says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa. So this guy's just a, just a shepherd, right? Uh, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of um, Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Um, and uh, basically, again, he just pre- he's just preaching judgment against the uh, uh, northern uh, kingdom of Israel. But he also ends the, um, his book with the promise of Christ, you know, of the millennium once again. The millennium with the promise of Christ coming to rule and reign on the earth. And in Amos, if you go to Amos 9, just go to the end there, Amos 9 verse 11, just so you can see this. Amos 9 verse 11. So even though he's preaching against the northern kingdom, he ends speaking of the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay? And this is what he says in Amos 9 11. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Okay? What's the tabernacle of David? It's not talking about the, the temple worship there. It's talking about basically the t- like the, uh, uh, his kingdom you know, and, and the lineage of his kings. And you can see here there's coming a time when that kingly line will fall, will fall, okay? But it's going to be raised up again, Amos 9, 11. That day will I raise up again. It's going to come back. And then it says, and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins. And I will build it as in the days of old. So this is the promise of Christ coming back and being that, you know, uh, uh, following after the, the kingly line of David, being the king of kings and the lord of lords, um, on the earth. So that's Amos. The next one is Obadiah. Obadiah. And uh, Obadiah is an interesting name because if you read your Bibles, you're going to come across Obadiah a lot in your Bible and uh, you're going to be fooled into thinking it's all the same guy. Some people think there's 12 Obadiahs in the Bible. Some think it's 13. Oh, I'm not going to take a guess. <laughs> it could be one of those. Uh, it, it could be a totally different Obadiah. I guess it was a pretty popular name at the time. So there were several. We don't really know exactly who he was. But we do know he was from the southern kingdom. But instead of preaching against Israel or Judah, he's actually a prophet against the Edomites. Now, in, in, as we're going through Genesis, who are the Edomites? Well, they're the descendants of Esau. Right? The twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau's descendants. One of Esau's names will be Edom. And his descendants will be known as the Edomites. And so he prophesies against the Edomites, against the wickedness that they did to Israel, and prophesies of their destruction, that God will destroy the Edomites. Um, and it also, Obadiah also ends with the restor- uh, restoration of Israel, which appears to me to be about the millennial kingdom as well. Okay? Then we go to the book of Jonah. And Jonah, again, one of these famous minor prophets. What, why is he famous? Famous because he was swallowed by a whale. So it's often taught, you know, during Sunday school lessons and children's, you know, cart- kids' cartoons and things like that, the Jonah. So Jonah was a, one of those few prophets from the northern kingdom of Israel. Many of them came from the southern kingdom. He came from the northern kingdom of Israel. And uh, again, he wasn't really a prophet preaching against his own people, but he was a prophet against the city of Nineveh, okay, against the city of Nineveh, which was the capital city of the Assyrians. And remember, the Assyrians were powerful. They were getting powerful. They were going to overpower, eventually, you know, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And this is why he doesn't like them, because he's from the northern kingdom. They're a threat to him, and he wants God to destroy them, all right? And, uh, and so God calls him to go and preach against the Assyrians. And, of course, they turn from their wicked ways. God shows mercy and lets them basically alone for a little while. And later on, we'll see what happens to them. But uh, Jonah's, you know, obviously famous for being swallowed by a whale, but in particular because he was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, which is a picture of Christ's death, that he was dead for three days and three nights. So it's one of those uh, very powerful types that we have in the Bible of Jesus Christ. And that uh, Micah, Micah is the next minor prophet. Micah is from the southern kingdom, but again, he was a prophet to the northern nation, the northern nation of Israel. If you go to Micah 1.6, go to Micah 1.6, please. It says here, Micah 1.6, Therefore, I will make Samaria, now pause there for a minute, Samaria became the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. 
Okay, that's where you get the, 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 the term the Samaritans. Okay, so here he's preaching against this, oh, or, or prophesying against Samaria, I, and that would be just basically against all of the northern kingdom. Therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. So, what Micah is basically prophesying is when the Assyrian Empire would come and take them into captivity, will come and scatter them the northern kingdom, and that's what he's prophesying about there. So, yeah, prophesies of Israel's captivity and scattering of the Assyrians. But Micah is also very famous for pinpointing where Jesus Christ would be born. Okay, and that's the town of Bethlehem. That's prophesied in the book of Micah. After Micah, we have Nahum. Nahum, and uh, Nahum preached, preached during the reign of King Manasseh. So that's mentioned for us in there. Um, and Nahum is kind of a continuation of Jonah. Okay, Jonah was sent by God to preach against the Ninevites. God satisfied by their repentance, but then, as it is, just like the Jews, just like the Israelites, uh, the Ninevites, after a few generations, they've gone back to their wicked ways. Okay, back to their wicked ways, and now we have Nahum being sent to prophesy against them. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, yeah, Nahum, sorry, yeah, Nahum. And uh, so it's a bit of a continuation. He goes back and the Assyrian Empire was basically seen as a, as a growing threat, um, even to Judah. So they had already take, conquered the northern kingdom, but now the southern kingdom are kind of concerned, man, are these Assyrians going to come after us? And so Nahum's, you know, prophesying about the destruction. So I'm sure it's, 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 uh, his preaching was really uh, probably received quite well by the Jews at the time, knowing that God would take care of them. They're not, they're not going to be destroyed like the northern kingdom was. And... Um, yeah, basically preached of this destruction, which ultimately then they no longer became a powerhouse. And uh, we'll keep going. And after name, there's Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk lived at the same time as Jeremiah. And he prophesied also just before the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom. And uh, what's interesting about Habakkuk is chapter 3. Chapter 3 is a great song that Habakkuk writes, or a great prayer, I should say, a great prayer. We're not going to look at that prayer right now, but it's a great prayer because he knows, Habakkuk knows that, you know, the Babylonians are going to basically, you know, uh, conquer the southern kingdom, okay? I mean, if, you, if God told you, you know, that some nation was going to conquer Australia and, you know, Australians were going to be taken captive and, and, and taken to a foreign world, and you knew that from the word of God, he told you those words, you'd be pretty concerned, you'd be pretty afraid and, and you know, just, just worried about the future. And that's what, you know, uh, Habakkuk is all about. But what's great about his, his prayer right at the end is that he, he finds, after he, he shares all his concerns to God, he, he leaves them with God, and then he tells God that he finds joy in his salvation. You know, that he, he just, I'm saved, God. You know, and I can find joy in being saved, even though there are tough times to come. And he also finds strength in trusting in the Lord. So, you know, if you're ever going through some tough times and you need some strength and some joy, some joy uh, read Habakkuk chapter 3. I think it will strengthen you as well. Uh, then after Habakkuk, it's Zephaniah. Zephaniah, you now he's a prophet to the southern kingdom. And he's actually a descendant of King Hezekiah. And he also prophesied of the fall of Nineveh, okay, um, of the Assyrians. And uh, Zephaniah lived in a very dark time of Judah's history. And he also writes a lot about the day of the Lord, about the wrath of God, just about the, the, the darkness, the gloom, gloominess, the, the wrath of God, the day of God's wrath. He speaks about this. And obviously, he's speaking about the Babylonian captivity. He's talking about Babylon taking over, um, conquering uh, Judah, but he's also carrying that double meaning. He's, he's also preaching that double meaning, referencing the coming day of the Lord, you know, which will be when the, the Lord pours out his, the fullness of his wrath upon the entire world, so that's Zephaniah. And then we have Haggai. And so, of all these prophets so far, they've all been prophets that have preached during the times of the kings. Some of them preached during the captivity of Babylon. They were there like uh, Daniel was. You know, he was one of those captives in Babylon. And then we have Haggai, and he's one of the very few prophets that are a prophet after the captivity. After those 70 years that they were in Babylon, Israel are returning back to Jerusalem, as we heard last week, they came back to rebuild the city, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple. And so Haggai was a prophet to uh, use to preach to the Jews after their return to the Babylonian captivity. And uh, 
you may recall that I, I explained that they were rebuilding the second temple. Well, the re- rebuilding of the second temple took a bit of a break. I think it was about 16 years where things stopped completely um, because of the opposition that was coming their way. And Haggai was that preacher, was that encourager to get the people back into the work. You know, he was one of that main guys, get back into the work, finish the job. And, you know, that's what God used Haggai for. And so he was a, he's, a, he's, a, he's probably an older prophet because he could recall back to the glory days of Israel before the captivity. And so he looks back at the former days and is excited, he's excited about the new beginning. He's seen the work being done, the Jews coming back. He's excited about the new beginning with the second temple and the rebuilding, rebuilding of Jerusalem. Then after Haggai, we have Zechariah. Zechariah is just like Haggai. And uh, he preached after the return of the Jews, following their 70 years of exile in Babylon. And he was calling the people to turn their hearts back to God. So they're coming back physically, okay? But uh, Zechariah was really trying to work in their spiritual hearts, their hearts. You know, are you searching the Lord? Are you trying to do things, you know, uh, as, as the Lord commands? And so he's trying to get their hearts to turn back to the Lord. And Zechariah has some of the clearest references of Jesus Christ when he comes to the minor prophets, some of the clearest references. You know, he, he speaks about his first coming and he also speaks about the second coming of Christ. That's, that's Zechariah. And then we have our final minor prophet in Malachi. Malachi. He is also a prophet after the exile, after the 70 years being brought back to Jerusalem. But he may have, he, the idea here is that he probably preached about 100 years later. 100 years later after they, they came back, and so he's, he's of a different generation than Zechariah and Haggai were, okay? And here's the thing. We don't know a lot about this time period, but it seems like they started well. They came back, rebuilt the temple, were offering the sacrifices, doing the temple worship. Looks like things were going well for a while. And as the Bible common theme is, after several generations, they've gone back to their wicked ways. If you go to, go to Haggai 1, Haggai chapter 1 verse 1, it kind of tells you the spiritual condition of, of Judah at this time. Malachi 1.1, 1, 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. These are the words of God. He, he says, I, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. And so, just the beginning of Malachi, just, you know, the Jews here are like, God, do you even love us? Like, you can just see the spiritual condition. Like, things have deteriorated. They're not excited anymore. They've lost a bit of the love of God. And they feel like God uh, doesn't love them. And so Malachi is, you know, telling them, yes, you know, God does indeed love them. But he also criticizes, Malachi does, because they had made a mess of the temple worship. They weren't doing things properly anymore. It all, it all, it all started to fall apart once again, okay, which is a really sad thing. You know, it was, ex- it was an exciting start. And then things, you know, after about 100 years later, things tended to go back to their old ways. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's almost a bit of a sad book because it's the last one uh, that we have in the Old Testament. But I love how it ends. You know, I love how it ends. So go to Malachi 4, Malachi 4 verse 5. So it's not all doom and gloom, but when we get to Malachi 4, 5, right at the end it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now we started reading from Acts 10. And we saw John the Baptist, you know, preaching Jesus Christ at the baptisms, right? Preaching Jesus Christ. And so we're coming full circle now. We're back, to, we're back here with Malachi in the Old Testament days. And he says, I will send you Elijah the prophet, which is identified as John the Baptist, coming before the, sorry, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Look what it says in verse number six. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So what do we have a promise of God right at the end? He says, lest I come. Jesus Christ is promising here that he's, got, he's coming. He's coming. And Isaiah, sorry, um, and uh, Elijah will come before Christ to get the hearts of the people ready. Okay? And of course, John the Baptist did such an amazing job, was able to get a whole brand new generation ready to receive Jesus Christ, to, to believe on Christ when Christ came. You know, many of the disciples of, of John the Baptist came and followed after Christ. So we end with this great promise, Jesus Christ is coming, that first coming 
And that's how the Old Testament ends. It's a perfect lead-in to the New Testament. So I hope that's given you, again, a bit more knowledge. Bit, you know, I mean, I sort of struggle as I'm going through this. I had so many notes and I had to really edit, edit it down to keep it within a sermon length. But uh, I hope that kind of enlightens your understanding of these books and appreciate them for what they are. And again, what did we see in Acts 10? Acts 10, verse 43. To him, to Jesus that is, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Yes, even the Old Testament prophets taught that salvation, remission of sins was by believing in him. Okay, believing in him. That's what the Old Testament prophets preached. And so please you know, I think one of the most exciting things when you're reading through the Old Testament, uh, have your mind set, have your heart set, where can I find Jesus as I read through that? And that's really, it's gonna, you're going to see it everywhere. You know, well, because you know the New Testament really well, you know the stories of Jesus really well, not just about him and his sacrifice, but the kinds of things he was able to do, the kinds of towns he visited, where he was born, all those kinds of things. And when you read the Bible, you, you, all of a sudden, Jesus Christ will be, the Old Testament, Jesus Christ will be popping up everywhere. Because that's what all the prophets wrote about. Praise God. Let's pray.